I'm here to tell you about some research that was published in the Open Access Journal, PRJ. It concerns plesiosaurs, extinct marine reptiles that were common all the way through the Mesozoic. Um, they went extinct at the same time as dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous, um, but they were in all the world's oceans. They were a very successful group. And an un unusual thing about them is that if the carcass is well preserved, um, they often found with stomach stones. The fancy name is gastroliths. And it's been a mystery for a very long time why they have these gastroliths. And so the suggestions have been to help them sink, to help them to grind up their food, or just accident material accidentally ingested um, in them. So we have today, Nile crocodiles are often found with stomach stones, um, but surprisingly alligators and caimans in the new world are never found with stomach stones. So that's a bit of a mystery. Walruses are sometimes found with stomach stones. So it's it's a huge mystery. Why do why do these animals have them? And so I could come to this project with a new slant. Um, my first degree was actually in geophysics. So I'm very mathematical and I tend to think in terms of math and, quant and quantitative stuff. So I can do a study of gastroliths. I can determine the masses of the gastroliths and I can determine the masses of the animals that hosted them. And you can do a calculation. Are, these, are there enough stones to make these animals sink? And it turns out, no, there's only, in the four animals I surveyed, I'll tell you about more about them shortly. Um, the four animals I surveyed, the greatest stone mass was just 0.2% of total body weight, a trivial amount. The animals inflating or deflating their lungs would produce a stronger effect. So I've actually published on this earlier, many years ago, I looked at sinking and buoyancy and plesiosaurs and stability. But over the past 30 years here at the Terrell Museum, we've had some many very good plesiosaur specimens from the early Cretaceous and late Cretaceous. And some of them have good quantities of stones, but unfortunately, um, the stones weren't perfect assemblages. They were either damaged when the specimen was struck by an excavator bucket, or they were lost near the time of death of the animal and the body wall was exposed. So I devised four different methods for estimating the missing mass or the hidden mass. Because another thing is some of these plesiosaur specimens were so nicely preserved that we did not want to move the bones and look inside. So we could see bones, I mean stones poking out between the ribs or there was a fracture through the surface and we could see the cut surface of the stones or broken edges. And I realized that with my math and computing, I could come up with a way to estimate the missing masses of stones. And that's what I did. And um, the reviewers thought it was a very novel approach and they, 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 they thought the ideas were quite new and interesting and worthwhile. So they said nice things about the paper. And um, I was also especially pleased that um, I was able to cite a paper from 1611 by the famous German mathematician and an astronomer, Johannes Kepler. He introduced this problem, how many spheres can you pack into a given space? And what's the densest packing you can obtain? And if you think about plesiosaur stomach stones, um, there was one, one of our specimens, the stones were very tiny, densely packed together, I couldn't get a reliable measurement from any of them. And so I realized I could use this Kepler hypothesis to estimate the mass of the stones. And it was such a tough mathematical problem that a formal rigorous solution wasn't published until 400 years later in, in 2011 um, by mathematician Thomas Hales. And he proved that the maximum density was about 0.74. And so I got a mass, a volume of this cluster of stones, and I calculated its dense, its, I knew the density of the stones. So density times volume gives you a mass, and then I applied this spherical packing correction factor to get the final value. So I was quite pleased that turned out. Um, in paleontology, we often cite old papers, like from the 19th century, but I don't think you can top 1611 as, as an, an old citation. Um, the biotech and cell biology people, they wouldn't cite something older than 30 years. So um, yeah, it's, it's nice to do that sort of thing. Also, I, 
one thing I like to stress with my work, my, my official job title is curator of dinosaurs, but I actually do other fossil reptiles as well. My last paper earlier in the year was on pterosaurs. Um, so there's all sorts of interesting questions you can ask about extinct reptiles. And um, coming at it with my math and computing, I can ask and answer questions in new ways and hopefully show new insights. So I often like to say there's more to paleontology than just digging up old bones. <laughs>